I am Wendell B. Harris, Jr., and you are listening to The World is Wrong Podcast. We're here to tell you how the world is wrong. The world is wrong about Red Red Belt. Belt. (laughs) Welcome. Two, The World is Wrong, an extremely positive podcast where we celebrate films and film artists the world is wrong about. I am one of your hosts, and my name is Andras Jones. And I'm the other host, and my name is Brian Connolly. And together, we are here to celebrate the film Red Belt from oh. the master of stage, screen, and in some cases, television. I guess that's a screen, too. Anyway, yeah. David Mamet. David Mamet, an American master. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm really excited to do. This is another one I feel that what you had this on your list uh, from the get-go, from when, before season one. And I was always like, yeah, can't wait to do Red Belt. Sure, it took us three seasons to get there, but we got here. We're here. We're doing it. I, uh, are you the kind of person who it, saves the best thing on your plate for last? You work through always. Yeah, me too. Always. <laughs> and like, and I'm also like, yeah. And like, so with movies, like I own or have bought movies that I know that I'm going to really like, or that I have loved, but I don't watch them. I'll watch like bench warmers too first, just because I, I'm like always saving it. Be like, Oh, I just, I can't, no, 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 I can't. And I, cause I treat it like Christmas or something. And so I feel like I have to earn Earn it, and then when I finally do watch one, I'm like, oh, why am I not only watching the movies that I know in my heart are really good? Because I feel like if, because if you do it all, and then like if we had done in season one, all the movies just on our list, and we finished it, like say we just did the list and it's done by the end of season one, which could have totally happened. Then what? What is, what is there to look forward to? What is there to savor and save? You know, like you gotta like. Say so you had to sprinkle the good things throughout. It's just you had to. Well, isn't it also a little bit like, you know, for me, Mordecai was one of the films that made me want to do this podcast. And you know, I, I it's I don't like that people hate Mordecai, but I also kind of like it doesn't hurt that people hate Mordecai. <laughs> I like that I get to champion Mordecai, but it, but then there are films like this, like Red Belt, that. It just kind of like it hurts more deeply that the world is wrong about it because <laughs> David Mamet is a point in his career at this point when we people should at least be looking at it and saying, oh, well, here's someone who's pretty good at the top of his game. And this film is such a fantastic movie. And Chibatel yeah. Ejiofor is just so amazing in this role. And not even amazing. He's just his he's such has such easy and natural charisma throughout this. It yeah. just. It's yeah. kind of like you have to put it in a different place in your brain. It's not fun to think about how the world is wrong about this. It's kind of fun to think about how the world <laughs> is wrong about Brown Bunny, right? It's like, I mean, yeah. it's obvious. Yeah, cause, and, and, like, and it doesn't hurt because you're like, well, yeah, I understand why you hate that movie or why you're repulsed by it. But this one, it's like, no, this should be on. Well, we're, we'll get into yeah. it. We're, we're, we're jumping ahead here. <laughs> yeah. uh, let's, let's, so, well, let's play let's, a clip from the movie and then we'll come back and we'll talk about it. There might be spoilers. There might be spoilers. There might be spoilers. So what is jujitsu? Uh, uh, use one fighter's strength against him? Yes, in a way. Uh, you, you let him use his strength, and you use your understanding. So it's a form of wrestling. Yeah. Like we see in the mixed martial arts uh, yeah. competition. That's right. Yeah. You compete? No. Because... Competition is weakening. Because it's fixed. Two guys in a ring, people betting money. Maybe fixed. Any one fight may be fixed. Uh huh. But you train people to fight. No, I train people to prevail. <laughs> in the street, in the alley, in, in combat, the bodyguard, the cop, the soldier, there's one rule put the other guy down. Now, you have to train in order to do that. And any. Any staged contest must have rules. Everything has rules. The problem is sticking to them. Oh, man. Okay. So, 
Uh, plot, and uh, it's good to know up front, if you're not familiar with the work of David Mamet, he, like in M. Night Shyamalan, deals very much with plot twists and plot surprises and, and twists and turns. So we are definitely going to ruin this movie if you haven't seen it already, because there is things you're going to have to talk about that's going to happen to these characters and in the plot. So right now, turn it off now if you don't want that spoiled because we're going to spoil it. <laughs> Maybe in the plot description. Uh, so, Red Belt, uh, 2008, written and directed by David Mamet. Uh, the film is about Mike Terry, played by Chuitel El Jafor, and he runs a Brazilian jiu-jitsu dojo in Los Angeles. And he is uh, where we kind of jump into him in the middle of a lesson, He's teaching a cop who is one of his students, Joe Collins, played by the great Max Martini, how to get out of a chokehold. Uh, and the other student in there is a character named Snowflake, played by Jose Pablo Cantillo. And they're going through this whole lesson, and it's very mammity. There's a lot of the word repetition, which is throughout this whole movie. It's a lot of, you know the escape, you know the escape, the escape, saying lots of words. If you don't like word repetition, you're not going to like David Mamet. Turn the movie off now. Uh, and in, out of the pouring rain, comes a lawyer, Laura Black, who none of these gentlemen know. She's kind of in an estate because she's trying to get medication, I'm assuming for herself. The pharmacy closes, she's freaking out, it's pouring rain, and she hits somebody's car and just kind of st stops on the brakes and then just runs in panicked into this dojo, interrupting the lesson. Everyone's like, okay, it's okay, lady, calm down. Uh, Mike is really trying to calm her down. He's, she, he's like, it's okay, it's hey, take off your jacket, it's okay. Joe comes behind her to take off her coat. She freaks out accidentally or whatever grabs the cop's gun that was kind of laying out that he put down because after you know before he does his little lesson he's not gonna have his gun on him he's a cop and she just just she fires the gun and it breaks the window of the dojo and there's a moment of what the fuck what do we do and everyone agrees it's okay it this didn't happen this didn't happen i didn't see anything she didn't fire the gun she didn't almost try to kill a cop we're going to go our separate ways now. And thus begins the whole crazy plot oh, of yeah. Red Belt. Uh, I don't know if I need to go into all the details, but basically this movie is about honor. It's about pride. It's about uh, masculinity, toxic masculinity, not toxic masculinity. Uh, there, uh, Mike Terry is really, really good at jujitsu, but doesn't really care to flaunt it. He doesn't want to do competitions, even though... Uh, his wife's uh, brother, his brother-in-law, uh, kind of is always trying to press him to fight. Uh, people around him are always trying to get him to do these competitions. He's like, no, no, there's, there's no point in that. There's no honor in that. I don't want to do that. And through the twist and turns of a very Mammothian plot, he has to do <laughs> a competition. Uh, the plot involves some double crosses. It involves a Hollywood actor played by uh, Tim Allen. It involves a producer played by Joe Mantegna, a mysterious magician played by an actual magician, Siro Takayama. Uh, Randy Cotier is in it. Uh, actual MMA fighters are in here. There, there's so much going on in this movie, but because it's David Mamet, every scene works for it. Like there's nothing wasted. Like this is true lean to the point filmmaking it's no surprise that he got to start as a you know a, a award-winning playwright because just like in theater every word counts every gesture counts everything counts for the plot and the theme there is no fat in this movie zero fat it comes in at pretty much a swift hundred minutes and this to me this movie is great a great example for anyone who wants to just make a great you know, concise movie, like maybe one of the most concise films I've ever seen. And that's Red Belt in a nutshell. <laughs> I love in a nutshell. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, how is the world wrong about this film? Well, <clears throat> this movie, uh, it's so clearly I'm a fan. Cl cl we'll see clearly that you're a fan of this film. This movie, uh, this is the last movie directed by David Mamet theatrically. He made a TV movie after this and a few shorts, but this is his last movie with a real budget. It was $7 million with real stars uh, in the theater. 
and it didn't make its money back. It was uh, critically divided. Half the people loved it. It was on many people's best of lifts, and the other people kind of scratched their heads, and they were like, why is David Mamet doing this kind of action movie? What's going on? Uh, and it just sort of, you know, 2008 isn't that long ago, and this movie's just been kind of forgotten about. Like, this movie's never mentioned when people talk about the best movies of the 21st century thus far. And I feel in general, David Mamet's not really talked about as a great filmmaker. I think he's certainly talked about as a great playwright and one of the most important playwrights, but I think his filmmaking kind of gets pushed to the side. And when people do embrace his filmmaking, like Criterion or, you know, film people, they tend to embrace kind of the more earlier stuff, the stuff that does feel more like his plays and less the later stuff that has a, a little less you know of of the lots of talking and it's definitely more of a film and i think he this movie is him this is my favorite film of his and i think this is the height of any filmmaker if some a filmmaker can make this movie this good amazing bravo and it's just sad that this isn't talked about i wouldn't even say is enough it's not talked about at all at by all. anybody and by anybody <laughs> it's just kind of forgotten movie uh, just left, you know, in the in the bin, uh, which I think is totally wrong. This rewatching this, I was reminded that this really is one of my favorite movies of all time. I saw it in the theater when it came out, and I no joke saw it in the theater five times in one month because that's how much I loved it. <laughs> well, uh, let's let's talk a little bit about David Mamet. You're, I, I'm a big. Mamet fan. I feel like in general, when I'm talking with people, I know more Mamet than them. But that is not the case with you. You have gone even deeper <laughs> in your exploration of yeah. Mamet. So can just give us your give us your Mamet overview. I think I just feel like I I he was one of the first filmmakers I kind of studied post college and writers because I wanted to be a playwright. So I read every play and I watched every movie. And it's there's just something really he has a very unique voice as a writer for sure. Uh like his 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 dialogue is really uh like the people talk a lot, but his dialogue is very spare. It's very it's very it's very like Hemingway in a way, where it's just very concise, it really cuts to it, and it's a lot of repetition and and it's he deals with you know, very almost like he he's very upset. His themes he's obsessed with. There's a lot of stuff about, you know, masculinity. You get like some toxic masculinity and like Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross and uh, <laughs> State and Maine <laughs> and Speed the Plow. And uh, but then he also is very interested in magic and trickery and deceit and uh, and and conspiracy. And there's and he's just also interested in points of view and sort of like different points of view, like in the, his play Oleana, which he also directed the the film of. It's about sexual harassment, but it shows it from both perspectives, from the, the harasser and the person harassed, and then it makes you kind of question which is what. And it just makes for very compelling filmmaking, writing. It's, it's just like there's something about his work that is super unique. And in him as a director... Like I said in my description, like there's something just so tight about his filmmaking. There's not a lot of film making flourishes. Like he's not really stylish. The camera is not going crazy. Uh, it just like his. I feel his filmmaking, his visual aesthetic, really matches his writing. It gets really to the point. It's really simple in a way, but not simple in a way where it's stupid or or just breezy. It just it's just it's to the point. Like it's very. Hemingway to me where it's like everything counts and it's to the point and you don't need all this other garbage and his nev he's never made a movie that's three hours long nothing even close uh, and this is his last movie in my opinion like after this he directed the Phil Spector TV movie which is fine I don't really remember a lot about it the performances are great but I feel like this kind of marks the end of this journey that started with House of Games back in 1987 and uh, yeah, do you want to briefly talk through kind of his other movies? Because I know that you've been watching some of them or have seen them. Oh, yeah. Do I will. I do a little. <laughs> my first experience with David Mamet, I saw American Buffalo on Broadway. Wow. In like 1983. Uh, my uh, my mom 
had a friend who was in the New York theater world and it was uh, Al Pacino. And, wow. And J.J. Uh, Johnston, who was chosen oh, in this yeah. film. Yeah. Uh, was also in it. And <laughs> I just remember him. I remember Pacino, he comes in from the audience and he's just like, Fucking Ruthie, fucking Ruthie, fucking Ruthie, fucking Ruthie, fucking Ruthie. <laughs> like it, it just goes on. He just, he, he was just that repeating that thing over and yeah. over until, I don't know. It, like, I remember it as being until it was just beyond, 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 beyond. And I'd never experienced anything like that. And I yeah. also was lucky enough to see Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Not on Broadway, but the Broadway touring. Like they're, they're mm-hmm. they were doing. I think maybe they were opening, doing like an opening thing in Boston, and then going to back to New York. But I got to see that with that was it made it very hard to watch the film because the film is great. I've grown to love the film, but uh, it was Joe Montana in the Pacino role. Oh, nice! And Peter Falk in the Jack Lemmon oh. role. Oh my god! And. <laughs> It was just, it was such a funnier play. (laughs) Jack Lemmon was great, but he's so sad. And Peter, like, Jack Lemmon is a different kind of sad than Peter Fox sad. Even Peter Fox sad is is like he, like in, you know, Woman on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown, you like, you you just feel for him, but you don't, it's not like suffering. Like, there's something about it that like. (laughs) Like his sad is like, I'm going to sip a beer (laughs) on the back of a truck and kind of frown as opposed to I'm going to go kill myself like Jack Lemmon and uh, (laughs) Glenn Gary and Glenn Ross. So, (laughs) so there was that. And then. You know, so and and I remember, I mean, I saw House of Games in the theater. I mean, not in the theater. Like I saw the movie, the House House of Games in the theater. And then I remember seeing Homicide, the one after yeah. that. Mm-hmm. And then I was just on for the ride. I was just I feel like I saw yeah. every film he made, although there are a couple of uh, there are a couple of missing spots in there, but not many. Yeah. Like I saw Vanya um, on 42nd Street. I uh, like I was yeah. I was that was a time when I was just seeing everything and I when I look at his filmography and to see Red Belt at the end and there there's nothing after is like I mean I know he has he has become a pretty uh I guess right wing and whatever he's be, he's be, if you Or he may have always been Yeah you whatever know. I don't again I don't really <laughs> care about I, like I don't I, I guess I mean I care I care about politics, but I don't really care about his individual politics. I don't feel like his films are. You know what? Here it is. If you're if you're making something that is intelligent and thoughtful as art, to me it is de facto progressive in the sense that if it's intelligent, it makes you think. If you think, you're going to form your own opinions. If you form your own opinions you are going to argue with the reactionary whatever bullshit that the writer, the way he votes. Like if, (laughs) if David Mamet is a Trump supporter, but his plays and films make me think better than watching a Marvel movie, then I'm going to like, I might evolve to be a Trump supporter myself if that was already ingrained, (laughs) but I think it would even make you a smarter a less of an idiot Trump supporter, which is good for the world. Um, and I don't think his films, this film particularly, I don't know. I mean, it's weird. I don't, I, I, I guess we, I had to throw this in there because I'm looking at, I'm, cause I'm looking at his Wikipedia and it lists this filmography and then it lists some, like a whole list of, uh, I don't know, shitty things he supposedly said under political <laughs> views that I never yeah. knew until I got here and someone else might get here and think the same thing, like notice the yeah. same thing. But I would, I'd be hard pressed. Like, I think films in general, the world of filmmaking is pretty conservative in terms of the ideas that are generally accepted in terms of film. Like just that, you know, so many films are based upon revenge and revenge yeah. is an innately, I think, conservative reaction to any problem um yeah (laughs) so and it also drives it also drives drama so you know i get why people put it into movies but my point is that so i think films are inherently 
there's a lot of conservative ideas that are in a lot of films that are never called out for being that. Or like and, yeah, vigilantism yeah. is in a big theme in movies, and like that's such a creepy right. thing in real life, right? You know, like it's, you know, it's, it's, celebrating it's, war and that there are war, good, that there yeah. are good sides of a war, bad sides, right? Yeah, and, and all yeah. of that is like all very conservative thinking. So my point being that whenever an intelligent and individual and unique voice makes it into that world and is able to establish that voice and establish that intelligence. I think that in itself is sort of the opposite of that punishing mode because that kind of unique voice and that having an individual point of view and having that intelligence is usually what gets shut out or picked on or excluded from the world of big budget movies it, as mm. much as we kind of see in Red Belt, which is kind of about exactly this very thing. And when <laughs> that kind of is, is able to to get into it, whether it's through Charlie Kaufman or David Mamet or Woody Allen are three that come to mind. Like, I will, you know, I'll take the eggs as, as Woody says, you know, it's like uh, in that, that joke from Annie Hall. I thought of that old joke, you know, the... This, this guy goes to a psychiatrist and says, Doc, uh, my brother's crazy. He thinks he's a chicken. And uh, the doctor says, well, why don't you turn him in? And the guy says, I would, but I need the eggs. Yeah, there's, I don't, this film does not bring out, I don't know, some some rabid conservative conservatism uh, in me or. No, I think it's a very sensitive movie. <laughs> yeah, it is a very, yeah, it is. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so can I ask you one question about this film sure. in the context of all of the work you've, you know, all of Mamet's work? Yeah. And then we're going to we're going to get into it. How would you say that this film or is this film the culmination? If if I were to tell you that da this that David Mamet chose to for this to be his last film, he doesn't want to make any more movies. That's it. How is this? <laughs> like a, f a perfect final statement. I think that it, it kind of has, it kind of hits all the points that his other stuff is hitting at. Like it, it reminds me of like when you watch like Mulholland Drive and that could have very well have been David Lynch's last movie, but it thankfully wasn't. But like that, like the things that the person kept trying to aim for or like the themes they keep coming back to, like all kind of come together in a nice, you know, gumbo <laughs> here. So you have like, just uh, you you have this sort of like men in a place where it's just mostly men kind of talking to each other and and it's the repetition like that feels to me very much like Glen Gary Glenn Ross you have this sort of ridiculous version of Hollywood full of conceit which is very state in Maine you have um this this kind of conspiracy which is uh, which is very uh, and Double Crosses, which is very much like in all his stuff, like Spartan and Heist and House of Games. You have his obsession with magic and magic tricks and kind of illusion, which is uh, also in like in everything like Spanish Prisoner. And he did a stage show with Ricky Jay, which, you know, he's a, his obsession with Ricky Jay. And so I just feel like it's just like it's all these things. And then you have this this kind of this added element that that I feel like I haven't really seen before and his, and his other stuff, like this kind of Kurosawa, John Woo sort of like honor among men sort of thing that he feel he hits that in the unit, his TV show, the unit, which was kind of hit a few years before this. And I don't know. It just, I feel like it really does to me feel like it's, it's everything he's been building up to, but also he's finally broken out of, I feel the same way. I think that his last two movies, like we can talk about Spartan too, if we want, or save that for a whole episode. But like, I feel Spartan, which he made right before this and this are the two movies where he finally yep. kind of broke out of that kind of playwright filmmaker. And now he's just a filmmaker who was a playwright. And I think it's like this, this movie still every scene feels like it could be in a play in that it's like every scene has its themes. Every scene works for itself. It's, it's a lot of like the blocking and the talking and the way that through dialogue, you're, you're building the story and these themes, but like it, but it just, there's this more of a filmic quality to this movie, just like with Spartan where there, it's like, I think it, 
doesn't hurt that he had Robert Elswit as his cinematographer who had done like all the Paul Thomas Anderson movies before this, like Punch Drunk Love and Magnolia and Boogie Nights and Heart Eight and There'll Be Blood. So it's like you have a, a great visual artist to work with. And this in this and there's a lot of silence in this movie. Like it has that mammoth, you know, talk and, you know, but it also has these gr amazing quiet moments and you have a main character with Mike Terry that isn't sort of this mile a minute talker like you would with his other stuff, like it, like like Joe Montana House of Games or like all the characters in Glengarry Glen Ross or like State and Maine or whatever. Like, so you have like this really quiet lead that really can just emote with his eyes and his face. Like he has the most amazing face <laughs> that you're instantly drawn into an instantly sympathetic. So I feel like he took what he learned and was building to and then heightened it here, which is all the more sad that there isn't more after this, because like I feel like he went to the next level of filmmaking with Red Belt and yeah. maybe Spartan. And I wanted more of that. It's like you you learn it's almost like someone going through all the belts in jujitsu. Like he earned his red belt <laughs> with red belt. Like like <laughs> Spartan's the black belt. Red belts, the red belt. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, uh, yeah. And I just, I don't know. I just feel like I, I'm in, just in love with every shot in this movie, every moment, like just everything. There's nothing in this movie that I, I'm not like totally fascinated by and totally in love with. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let, then let's get into talking about it. Uh, yeah. So you, you mentioned, uh, Chiwetel Ejiofor as Mike Terry, and you know we start in this training sequence that if you don't know Mamet and you watch it, I think this is one of the cases. This is one of the things about following a writer or a filmmaker that once you're really in and know what they're doing, it the film works on all these different levels. So. He's so you have Chiwetel Ejiofor uh, coaching the his cop buddy in this uh, competition where he he has come up with this new wrinkle on the fight, which is that they randomly select a red, I mean a, a black marble or a white marble and if you get the black marble you have a handicap which is also randomly chosen which might be your arm behind your back or your leg tie, something you know you might be blind I don't know, blindfolded there might there, there's some handicap that you have to fight through and this is a, like a really important part and one of the things in the film that actually really spoke to me just that whole having come up with a randomizing way to improve upon a, what you consider to be a degraded art form that you stood that you believe in really strongly uh, very mm -hmm. much speaks to the radio eight ball in me it's very much the way that i came to radio eight ball it was like oh i love playing uh, playing music in front of audiences but audiences aren't listening the way i want them to listen hey if we have this randomized element then this thing could maybe be what it's supposed to be yeah, yeah. anyway so that that spoke to me a lot but what i but watching it watching it's so great because the 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 training sequence is going to of course it's going to be a lot of repetition but it's also this great just like Pacino coming in fucking Ruthie fucking Ruthie fucking Ruthie and this he's saying there's always an escape there's always an escape there's always an escape and he's shouting at him and so he's doing what the character sort of what you're talking about like kind of about this whole film and why it, it how it wonderfully merges the mammothness with just just cinema with like when Pacino comes in shouting that it's Mammoth saying, look at me, I can repeat something over and over. Now <laughs> he's found a situation where that repetition over and over is completely in the world of the film in a way that you don't even notice it as mammothy repetition until you go back the second time, even as a mammoth viewer. The first time yeah. I wasn't I was watching it, I wasn't thinking, oh, this is him doing that. It's just like, oh no, this is what you do when you're training someone. And yeah. uh and one of the things that I, I thought was really, really powerful, I don't know if you picked up on this, probably you did, but just the way so the Mike Terry character, he's the hero, he's trying to do the right thing all the time. But in almost every situation, it's his action or inaction 
that creates all of the bad things that happen. <laughs> you know, like in the beginning, he's the one who goes to his friend to say, to say, hey, I want to show you how to why you shouldn't use your your holster that way. And then takes his gun out because yeah. he grabs him by that. Or yeah. he tells the woman to come in and says, hey, grab her coat. And yeah. He goes <laughs> like at every turn, the night, the nice right guy who were who is the hero. He is set up by the film to be totally responsible for every bad thing that happens in this that sets up that puts yeah that makes it just like it starts ratcheting from that very moment and if you watch the way that they shoot it and the way they're playing it he's all just so relaxed and charismatic and easy and being nice and everything he's doing is being nice and he is just destroying the world around him yeah like if he hadn't uh tried to figure out the situation with the watch that was stolen mm -hmm. you know the stolen watch that he actually if he hadn't gave. given the watch to the guy <laughs> in the first place and given the watch to the guy to help him pay off the thing if he hadn't yeah, uh, yeah like like everything he does it just ruins it for everybody else and that's um, just you know is, isn't that like the the epitome of like the put the cat in the tree and then start throwing rocks at it or like yeah idea of screenwriting <laughs> except <laughs> so it, elegant like something about it, it goes down it doesn't so feel easy. mean yeah you know like i think in other movies yeah. when you have the character who's like the ultimate like nice person and they keep fucking up or the world keeps turning on them it's it could feel really mean and be kind of hard to watch but this movie i i think it's because of the performance and just because of like where the movie ends up like it does it, it, the movie doesn't ever feel like it's being cruel to the character like you're you're kind of like oh man why is everybody being awful and like they are being cruel to him but to the audience like you're not it's not like a Lars von Trier movie it's not like Dancer in the Dark where you're just watching this horrible stuff happen to this person for 90 minutes um and then it all builds up to the end and the end makes you feel so good so it just well, and I think like that it's this. also and it may be so one of the areas, so after many watches, of course, I, some of the sort of the prejudices of the film, which may come off as flaws, come through. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that that struck me was just how, like how the film sets up his wife as the bad guy, such the bad guy <laughs> in this. And, she, oh, but she's also in a pretty she's put in a pretty rough situation because of his honor and there is something like her point of view in this is like we need to pay bills and your yeah. honor is not paying our bills and i'm <laughs> having to work plus having to work and it's like she's doing all his accounting like she's doing her own job she's yeah. doing all his accounting and he's walking around being the honorable guy. I found myself like, even though the film has her do some dastardly stuff later on, I do find myself self having some sympathy for definitely. Her. And yeah. there is something about him, like his goodness and his niceness. Like, it's not saying that it deserves to be punished, <laughs> but there is something about. I think maybe there's something about that character that he is looking for that kind of suffering. Like there's something like the, the way he sees honor is in a, uh, in Buddhism, there's like the, there's the Hinayana path and the Mahayana path. And forgive me if you're Buddhist scholars out there, I'm, you know, I, you probably know more than me, but the Hinayana path is like the, is this, is this the narrow path, the one of like, of, renouncement of do of fasting and and stepping away from the world and the mahayana path is the one that embraces is the more is the wider path that embraces mm -hmm. the world and says well we'll deal with the complexity and it is possible to be in light to find enlightenment and also eat a good meal uh or drink a glass of wine or whatever this character definitely seems like he he wants to walk the hinayana path uh but he's pulling all these other people into this world with him and yeah. the film ultimately rewards it, but you can see at the big, there's something in it. And maybe this is just mammoth being, a, a, again, being a, a intelligent enough 
to leave the contradictions in, mm-hmm. that there is something, I don't know, do you know what I'm talking about? That there's something, when you realize that he is responsible for all of this, it kind <laughs> of also justifies his, the way he approaches everything, his code. It like. His code wouldn't mean anything if he wasn't willing to see his friend commit suicide over it. Like there's like <laughs> like there's something in that. And I, it is maybe toxic. I mean, I'm sure if you're with if you're trying to be in a relationship with that guy, if you're in his family and you need you know, like dental work done or something, it would be very frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> that, that yeah. <laughs> you didn't, you know, whatever. I mean, I guess if he had sold the watch, what would happen? You know what? Uh, let, let's back up. We're not. Re- we haven't really. You kind of told the story, but we're ta- now we're alluding to all this stuff in it. Let, uh, how, how do we want to? How do we want to? I know we we're assuming Here, that let, the audience is watching. Let's this. do Cliff Cliff Notes plot. Okay. Okay. Let's do, so let's, let's go. Let's. So like he, the window is broken. They cover up, or they decide to not deal with uh, Laura shooting the gun because the because the cop and mike are like that she would go to jail yeah we're not going to deal with it uh that night he then goes to the club where the cop had worked as a bouncer oh can we just stop uh, here for one second because sure. the scene with the wife in the car about the club that was the most pure mammoth scene i feel like in the movie i thought you were going to the mountains no that's funny um joe joe's still inside no he just left left Maybe he went to the club. What happened to the window? Isn't he on at the club? Um, that's funny. Weren't you going to the mountains? Why would he go to the club? Isn't he working tonight? Club? No. No, no, no. He hasn't worked at the club in months. Listen, um, I have to tell him something. Okay? Tell him? Why? Why what? Why hasn't he been working there? Yeah, no. Listen, I gotta get home. Because they ne- yeah. like, they're just like, so you're at the club. He was at the club, but he's not at the club. Where are we here? Who's who's it? Like, there, it's two people talking past each other and getting the information they need, and it. But it sounds like poetry. It's so. I, I just, love it. I, I love it. I absolutely. I, I well, maybe I, that's not the scene that I that I played, but I might have to play this in here somewhere because it's just so good. Anyway, so the so the club is uh owned or run by his uh, Mike Terry's wife's brother. And they run their little MMA office out of it. And everyone in this there. world is in the same world. It, everyone yeah. knows each other in this world. It's and Ricky J is kind of laying out this competition he wants and like, they're, hey, Mike, you should do that. And I want to. And while that's going on, Tim Allen comes in, Chet Frake, this big TV movie star. He gets into a bar fight. Mike Terry steps in, saves the day. Then that kind of forms a relationship between Chet and Mike, because uh, because Chet sees on the security cam footage Mike Terry doing wait, all this wait, crazy wait, martial arts stuff. We got we got to back up uh, for a second. Oh, the guy who picks on Chet Frank is the actor Jake Johnson. Jake Johnson, who has gone on, he's now like on the verge yeah. of being like a super super. I think he's going to be a superstar, but he's definitely. Yeah. Uh, show, is this the first time he shows up? Could, it's a nice great, little moment. Yeah, it's a great little moment. Um, Awesome. Yeah. Oh, anyway. And I also forgot that there's a magician at the bar too who does Very this little important. sleight of hand thing where he turns a, die, a white die into a black die. And he says, so, he's one of the guys who has a line that you, that like, I feel like sometimes <laughs> Mammoth like lets people do a bad line reading and leaves it in. He's like, yeah. I'm so good. Buy me a drink or whatever. It's, it's really he's like, bad. I'm fucking, like, I'm fucking great. Buy me a drink. I'm fucking fantastic. Somebody buy me this fucking drink. <laughs> Uh, my other favorite line, which is almost like that, is Ricky Jay's, I love a fighter. What the fuck? <laughs> it's, a great, it's a great line. But uh, so then this forms a relationship with Chet Frank and Mike Terry. Uh, they hang out. Chet gives him as a, gives Mike as a gift, like a $25,000 like gold watch. And Mike gives his watch to Joe Collins, his cop friend, because he never got paid as being a bouncer at this club. And so he's like, pawn the watch, get the money, like pay your bills. Like, just, like you're, you're fine. You've earned it. And here's a black belt as well. Then he, Mike Terry goes and has dinner with Chet Frank and meets uh, Joe Montaigne, who is the oh, producer wait, 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 of wait, this. Sorry, uh, I've got to, I've got to, <laughs> you're, go, you're getting ahead and there are a couple of important things here. So during this is when uh, what's Emily Mortimer 
has stepped up. She pays for the window. Pays for the window. She she's an attorney. She wants to say thank you to the cop. Mike tells yeah. her that it's there's no big deal. And there's something I don't know if you noticed this, but the scenes there's a way that the scenes with the two of them are shot. Very, it it ends up becoming like widescreen. The vibe is widescreen, cinematic. I don't want to say romant, romantic, like it's like there's a romance of love between them, but romantic, like there's something, there's a way that all of the scenes with them are shot that yeah. has this whole other, like when we're talking about Mamet as a filmmaker, where he's doing something cinematically to place them in this like epic place. Um, yeah. So, uh, and, and this is when she starts to tell about how she was uh, sexually assaulted, how she was raped, basically, not basically how she was raped. That's what she says. And then she begins her training at the dojo, which mm-hmm. I think is an important part. I think where th- like her with her and the wife and the Rebecca pigeon character and just the way that women interact with this film uh, that's very macho is really useful. And her, her, I don't know, becoming a part of the dojo and becoming uh, a force there. I, uh, what, what do you think about, uh, let's just talk, take a second here. What do you think about the Emily Mortimer character in this film and how that plays out? I, I think she's great. And I think it's just like, she works with, with Mike as being sort of like the, uh, like one of the other people who is trying to do right and, but fucks up <laughs> or did like a big fuck up at the beginning, like because she fired the gun, like it is like caused this whole chain of events, but with him training her, he's teaching her this lesson. Like, like, like there's always an escape. There's always a way out. There's always a way for you to be the, the, the winner. Like there's a way to get out of everything. There's a way to get out. And oh, that scene I, it, where it, it, if I'm standing up close to you, if I tried to, if I tried to grab you, could you, could I? And yeah. she's like, well, no, but what if you went to the side and then from back here, that scene. Oh, so good. So good. Anyway. And, Sorry. and she kind of, I feel like it really is like fix fits in with the climax and we'll get to the climax. Like, the, like there's a moment between the two of them, the climax that just turns it all. Yeah, it's amazing. That yeah. could only happen with somebody who kind of has this under. Like, I think she, like, basically everybody turns on Mike Terry in this movie except for her and Snowflake. Like, they're the only two people at the end who are with Mike Terry on his journey. Everyone else mm-hmm. has totally betrayed him. Uh, so he, Mike, goes to this dinner with his wife at Chet Frank's house. Uh, the wife. Hits it off uh, with uh, Tim Allen's wife and fam and friends. Re- Rebecca Pigeon. My Rebecca fi- Pigeon. I got Ma'am, it's actual Le- wife. For just a second. She, one of my favorite, one of my like, just like favorite, favorite actresses. I I have to imagine that she doesn't have a Catherine Keener kind of career just because she's happy to do what she's doing. Because yeah. I feel like. Like she's like right there. She could be that play that character in every movie, like the coolest person in the film. God, I love that actress. Anyway, go on. <laughs> and um, so it, the, it turns out that uh, so Mike's wife, who does design work like uh, dresses and stuff, that's also what Rebecca Pigeon characters does. And they were like they basically hit off at this dinner party. Like, well, you let's work together. Let's collaborate. Let's do this. And what <laughs> what is what a what a coincidence! <laughs> and uh, but then at the same time, uh, Mike is explaining sort of his his sort of his his way of jujitsu and sort of what what his lessons are, and also he tells the story of the white pebble and the black pebble because his wife tells him to again. Go tell him the story. The the, the wife. And, it, the movie definitely sets up the wife to be setting him up. Like, <laughs> and of course, yeah. instantly, like Joe Mantegna is writing something down. Like, oh, interesting, this pebble thing. Okay, cool. And <laughs> just like that too. If you just slowed it down a little bit, that would be you did a pretty good <laughs> Joe Mantegna there. And, yeah. okay. <laughs> and. Uh, and uh, then this is when things start to go 
not so great. Um, oh, wait. First, it goes uh, a little bit great because there's the on-set oh, scene. He goes to set. That's right. So he goes to set, and that scene is great where it's uh, Mike Terry goes on set. He meets a friend there who's, uh, who's doing the stunt work, doing the choreography, and they have this great scene of like how to take the knife away from me. Take the knife away from me. And there's just this great choreographed little scene between the two of them as they're rolling around. And you're seeing sort of, it's like this movie or this TV show is like an Iraq war sort of thing. Uh, almost honestly looks kind of like the unit, the David Mamet it show does in look, a way. Yeah, it looked like that. <laughs> and uh, now this is when things Wait, 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 wait. wait. There's still, because the bet, the bet, I love the scene where you have uh, Tim Allen asking Mike Terry about the, like about his boots and about oh yeah like, yeah what's the number mean is that the shoe size yeah and he's like, no no that's that's when you know who someone is when they get blown up <laughs> yeah and just and just like that what is like ass yeah. on curb all this yeah. lingo you could tell there was something about this that just felt like i felt like like mammoth's on the set of something else writing this while he's hanging out with fight guys and like stuntmen and army guys who are like, he's having this, I don't know. There's just something There's such a, it's very, it's, it's very back and forth mammoth. Like I love when he has the line, maybe the guy learned it from the guy is a great line. Yeah. Uh, but it also very much works on these other levels. Like it's that behind the scenes stuff. It's giving you new information. Like it's just an interesting conversation between two people. Uh, Anyway, I know you're, you want to get to, to his trials and his tribulations, which are coming, but this is the last moment of it being good because he, then he's like, he wants to teach. They're going to hire him to work for the, yeah. for the production. They're going to use his training they're to be the fighting training, in the movie. And he sends them the training, including... Without signing any contract yeah. <laughs> at all. Like the whole time he's faxing all his stuff. I'm like, you idiot. You're supposed to sign. Get on paper. They're going to steal this. This is what Hollywood does best. They love to steal and lie. This is what they're going to do to you. And it's worth noting that Tim Allen is really good in this movie. Like he's for a non really non non-comedic role. Role, he's totally great. I don't know what David Mamet saw him in to convince him that he'd be really good at drama, but he's totally good at drama. Maybe this, this like, is where really the conservative good. thing comes in. Maybe just he's looking, <laughs> he's like, yeah, I could have like a really like have like a very like a beloved movie star in this role, but I yeah, everyone hates Tim Allen. Let's do that. Um, he's everyone kinda, loves Tim Allen. I don't know. I, not everyone hates uh, Tim Allen, but I you know he's like I don't know. He's definitely isn't he? Doesn't he seem like he? I don't know. Never mind. I'm gonna cut that part out. Okay. <laughs> so yes, he's, uh, so, he's fucking awesome. He's so the two things that kind of happen that kind of kind of go into the next level of hell for my poor Mike Terry is one, his wife borrows like thirty thousand dollars from the local loan loan shark played by you got david it. pamer <laughs> yes when I, when I saw pamer I, i'd watched this before but when i saw pamer i was like oh of course this is this. only only in david mamet's world would david pamer be like the loan shark and ricky J in charge of an mma uh, corporation <laughs> it's just like doesn't make any sense in reality these are not the type of people but these are the type of people you want to see in a movie do these things. Uh, and what's great about David Paymer is he seems like a very friendly loan yeah. shark. He doesn't seem scummy at all. He's just like, yeah, you know, when you first see him, he's just asking Mike, like, hey, do you have any leads on the, the fight? You know, I'm going to put some money on it. And he's just like, no, I don't. And he's like, OK. And then when he goes to him about his wife borrowing the money, it's like kind of like. It's not, not like fuck money. you. Pay. It's not like <laughs> fuck you. Pay me. It's more like oh well. Is there something we can do to figure this out? Like you can you put something. Do you have anything that's worth whatever? <laughs> and so that's going on. And at the same time, the watch that he gave to the cop is pawned, but turns out to be hot, stolen, and the cop is put on leave because of it. And so he has to fix that as well. And so Mike Terry. Um, Goes out to eat with Joe Montana and supposedly <laughs> with Tim Allen, who doesn't show up. This is Ed such the Hollywood. Walks in. This is so full uh, on Hollywood. Go uh, on. Ed O'Neill stops by to say hi, a little cameo. Uh, it's worth noting Ed O'Neill is good friends with David Mamet, like these sh Chicago guys. And Ed O'Neill uh, is a trained jujitsu practitioner. And I believe that he's the one who got David Mamet to get into jujitsu because uh, David Mamet had done it for six years before Red Belt. So 
jujitsu pals, David Mamet and Ed O'Neill. Don't mess with them on the subway. They'll, they'll, they'll chop you. Uh, but uh, so in this dinner, uh, quickly, Mike Terry talks about the, the, the watch being hot and it was pawned. And he's, it's a really awkward moment of like, oh, I don't mean to bring this up. And Joe Montana is like, oh, what? I can't believe someone sold me. I'll, I'll fix this. Hold on. I'll fix this. He leaves and never comes oh, back. So. <laughs> he just, it literally is like, the the scene in the the comedy when the guy's blind date doesn't show up or sneaks away to the bathroom and leaves where it's like everyone's left no food has been ordered he just like ate the bread basket and he's just sitting there sad alone and he's just like i guess he's not coming back and then this is when shit gets really fucked up and this is when it kind of turns into like a weird conspiracy or a weird just sort of like everything kind of being taken from this poor guy where they don't call him back he doesn't get the job he see he see his wife doesn't get to the to work on this fabric stuff. Yeah, they they just freeze um, her out. She's not getting any calls. They freeze everyone back. out. Uh, no one's calling him. The cop, the poor cop, kills himself because he confesses in this weird like basically like while like oh, back up. I'm getting see I'm getting confused with it. Uh, on TV, Mike Terry sees uh an ad for this MMA fight with Ricky Jay and his brother in law, and they're doing the the black and white marble thing that he told the same story so they basically like intellectual property stole <laughs> from him so he gets the lawyer uh emily mortimer to try to sue them uh it's not going well then joe montagna walks in to the, <laughs> the the legal proceedings and they're like wait a minute and he walks in the door saying something like hey it's your new partner <laughs> kind of on the no- kind of on the nose but that's okay Montaigne, you can like, sell it and, Montaigne, you can and sell so it. then the conspiracy thickens you're like oh wait a minute these people that you thought were two separate parties are actually working together to make this like M- big MMA fight that where everyone is going to make all this money off of it uh, with this new idea of this this sort of handicap pebble and that's when they're like we got it we are totally gonna sue you we got it mike terry and the lawyer are like we did it and then it twists again of no the cop actually confessed that the lawyer shot like tried to kill him and shot the window and they covered it up and this was mike terry's idea and he bribed the cop with a watch and blah 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 and total nonsense but, they're but they fun. have it's the sort of, they have the evidence but they, they, they have the evidence and the cop kills himself, whether or not he confessed to this or he was forced into it or who knows what. But he felt like he dishonored the dojo and dishonored his you know, leader. Uh, so he kills himself. And there's a great moment with his wife of who's going to pay the bills? Are you going to pay the bills? Are you? Are you? And then she shoves the bills in Mike Terry's front pocket. And that seems really intense. Um, and... So the, the, everyone just seems like it's just such a mess. And then why don't you take over? When does things turn into him getting into the – because he well, does eventually okay. have so to – throughout this whole thing, from the very first time uh, when Mike goes to see his brother-in-law because his wife tells him to, to, she sends him there to go borrow money from him. But instead of borrowing money from him, he asks about why he fired the cop. From or why he never yeah. paid the cop, yeah, and he sort of dances around the idea, and he's like, "You, you want money? Fight on the undercard. You can win fifty thousand dollars. You might win. That'll solve your money problems." He's like, "No, I don't do the, I don't do the uh, competition. I think competition is a is a demeans the art form, demeans the the work. The whole point. This is not a performance. This is not that. This is." This is a an honorable path, and you have you can't these you can't reconcile the two. That's basically he didn't. I did. Mm-hmm. That's my interpretation of what he what is communicated yeah. in those scenes. He doesn't ever it, quite uh, explain it as pedantically as I just did. <laughs> but uh, and the, but then that comes up again when he's when they're have doing the sort of legal negotiations with Ricky J and the attorney. Ricky J keeps saying, "You want the money? Fight on the undercard." You could win. So this is just sort of this. This keeps getting and he doesn't want it. He's not going to do it. He's not going to do it. And then after his uh, after his uh, friend kills himself and his wife is on the hook for the loan shark. 
to David Paymer or the people who David Paymer owes money to owes for $30,000 or so $35,000 and the price is just keeping going to keep going up and up and up. And I feel like there there might be some there might be some other initiating incident, but at the at this point he agrees to fight on the undercard. Yeah. Uh, and while he's there and JJ J. Johnston shows up and is very excited. He's there announcing the he's the the announcer. <laughs> I love it. his voice. It's like another great mammoth thing we haven't mentioned is Lake Boat. He didn't oh, direct it, but it's based on his play. Great. And JJ J. Johnson is so he is like the winner of that movie to, to me. He has a great speech about Steven Seagal. Yep. <laughs> and what a what a jerk he is. And how even Jerry Lewis could beat Steven Seagal in a fight, because that's what a what an asshole Steven Seagal is. And I couldn't help but think of that little speech when watching uh, Red Belt. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, talk, look, at, I saw so I saw him playing a supporting role in, in a mammoth play on Broadway in 83. Here he is in his last film. That's some loyalty. That's some actor director. He- yeah. Loyalty. And he shows up in lots and lots of stuff. If you don't know him, you do. If you watch a lot of mammoth. mammoth. Films. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but so in the course of this, he, he basically, he just gets so offended by the whole thing that he refuses to even fight. Like he walks away from the fight. And what do you remember? What is it? I'm sorry that, uh, what is it that, what was the thing that the, the last straw for him. Well, basically, what happens is that he um, he finds out that his wife was the one who t- sold the idea, like sold him out. Oh yeah. Uh, so like, because 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 he's talking to Joe Montana and he's saying like, because he's really upset that the that they brought in their his his teacher from Brazil, right. uh. And they're really upset that they brought him in, and he's just like, "Oh, this is offensive." And and then it's like, then it's revealed. You brought that, the like, old the... man down for this. You brought the old. You know. yeah. Oh, and then and, he finds and... out. Oh, that's yes. I'm sorry. I now so I'm he's, remembering. He's, he's upset that his wife sold out because he finds it through Joe Montana that she's the one who gave him. Uh, uh, what was it? it, it, it that he. Um, what what was the thing that he told him? I don't remember. She exactly. was the one who told about the, the window. window about the lawyer. Yeah, because he lets it slip. He's like, okay, the lawyer broke the window. So what? Like, you know, and he's like, how did you know that? How did you know that she did? Like, and so that's when it all comes together. What? And, what? And that's also when Ricky J is like, you thought you came up with a way to make to make the the fight more fair. You, yeah. No, you came up with a way to rig it, and that's when he finds out that. The magician from earlier is, is the guy is in a the, mask picking the guy the in a mask doing the, hand. Th- doing the sleight yeah. of hand and <laughs> that the guy the son the guy who's who brought the old man his trainer up from Brazil yeah. is going to throw when the fight. It's a sham. And it's just it's a t- gonna... so he just he wa- so he he walks out. He 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 does the again he does the honorable thing. He's like I'm and fuck walks everybody. Away. I'm out of here. Like this is so she sh- says this is so shameful. This is such a dishonor to like my craft and to our our leader who's here. And I forget that actor's name but plays the the they're his teacher, but he is um the guy who learned from Bruce Lee how to do um Oh wow! Martial arts, I, I believe. I, th- I think that's. I think I read that correctly. Yeah. So I'm sure if um, you know the fight business, this is e- <laughs> this film goes even deeper. But what, what, then we get. Can, hold oh, on, hold on. Wait, 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 wait. And what the the one question I had? So like this, this definitely could could be read as very convoluted because it's like they throw so much at you at the end here. Oh, but it all the, works. The, but it does. But at what point? Where in the story did the wife? tell Joe Montana about the win. Like, where did that well, happen? What I I'm think trying is, to figure that uh, out. Because well, also it's worth mentioning that she is now cool with Rebecca Pigeon again and they're sitting together dressed up all fancy and they're going to do their fabric business together. So it worked out. So for her to get that, she had to give up this information. I'm assuming to force yeah. her husband to do this fight. But where in the plot did that happen? Like, clearly when they go, when he goes to try to sue, this information is there. So where... When does that happen? You think? Well, we just know that she, the 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 last time we see her, she is freaking out because Rebecca Pigeon isn't calling her back. Yeah, 
And then the next time we see her, she's good with Rebecca Pinjin. And in the interim, uh, you know, basically Mike Terry's life goes to shit and he's not going to fight. And so we just imagine, I just imagine that at some point Re- Rebecca Pigeon reaches out and says, hey, or either her or Montaigne, her husband in the film, reaches out and puts the squeeze on her. Yeah. And, or on, actually, you know, who it, I'm sure it comes through her, bro- her brother. Who we, who, oh yeah, like he was like he was like hey like in like they talked about it because yeah. her brother is very sleazy. He's portrayed very, very dishonorable yeah. person. Yeah, uh, he is and... definitely like the guy. Uh, is it who's the guy who gets shot in uh, in Die Hard? The 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 sleazy coke guy <laughs> who's oh, always yeah, hitting yeah, on yeah, yeah. Uh, Bonnie Bedelia. <laughs> Like he's that guy in this movie, totally. Um, so yes, so then, so but he's so always he's he's offended. He's he's gonna walk away. He we all of a sudden big long cinematic shot. Uh, and and it's, this is the best shot in the movie. <laughs> it's so good. It's this. It's got. It's it's totally silent. So, but so full of meaning. Should we I not, love let's it. not even say what it is. And just in the off, because if you know it, then you know it. And if you don't, and I don't know why you're listening to this point, but just it's a long shot, very the, <laughs> like very theatrical as it's cinematic and theatrical. Uh, just he walks. He has a brief interaction with Emily Mortimer that is where that is unspoken but dramatic, and, and then, full of meaning yes. full of meaning and the themes of the film this is where all the themes really come to a crescendo yep. and what the movie is about and what he has been trying to tell people but forgotten this moment and what she has learned from him she tells him in a very special way <laughs> and, and then that kicks into the most thrilling climax <laughs> oh. where this like and and what's great and like I think it's worth mentioning if you haven't seen this movie, it's like this, this is basically like his version of like a blood sport movie. Like that's what was so exciting to me initially when this movie came out of like, Oh, it's David Mamet doing sort of like a Van Damme movie in a way, but like a really smart person and a really good writer doing this kind of like martial arts sort of movie where there's a competition. Like it's, you know, it's like, but it, and, but he does action, and this is the part where there's some really good action, but done in his way. And it's basically like Mike Terry trying to make his way from outside backstage all the way to the ring to expose the total bullshit that this fixed phony baloney competition is. And just the obstacles that he has to get through, almost like a video game. Yeah. But every, it doesn't feel yeah. moronic. It's just like there's like a constant like person who keeps trying to stop him and he's trying to get to see people's he's trying to get people's attention and he's trying to get in and people and he's just taking people out one by one in very believable realistic uh fighting. Like it doesn't feel phony baloney. It's it's like it looks really real. And like what's what's great. Uh, is that there is a really good stunt though thrown in there where he runs up the wall and does this kind of flip around. <laughs> well, wait, okay, so wait, that, wait, now you just wait, you just went too fast. Let me let's back up for a second. <laughs> so he's so he's he's decided he's going to go back and expose them. He yells to this guy, I don't know, but some uh, announcer who we all should know, the big bald muscly guy that's Rand, randy randy Cot- Cot- couture yeah i think is how you say his and name? he's shouting yeah. his name he's saying hey hey and but he, he walks away and then it's just like one security guard after another and he's just throwing them down and moving past them and like it's it's very slow and determined uh you say it's very realistic the only way it's not realistic is that if I, i'm sorry but i live in america and i know if a black man were just like assaulting security guards someone would shoot him or tase him maybe any man but this is america and it that is so that the whole time i was watching it there was a little bit of like suspension of disbelief that's like maybe once the cameras are on him which is about to happen in this description maybe but he doesn't get like he doesn't get two feet before someone uses 
uh, extreme force. The idea that all these security guards are just going to like throw themselves at him and fight fair, and then like... so maybe they <laughs> does they knew, they recognize him as he was going to be the comp that he was about to fight on maybe. stage before okay. he quit. So they're like, oh, that's the guy. You know, like if you were at a fight and like you know, like, I don't know. I feel like maybe they're like, oh, we saw him already hanging out with Ricky Jay and Joe Montana and all these and like the, the okay. people who put on the show. Maybe so maybe he's upset. Okay. Okay. He's not just some rando guy. I don't know. That's that's the pass I'm giving the story. You know what? It doesn't matter. Because at this point in the movie, the movie is set up. Like, the point is that he, that we are so wrapped up in the injustice and the honor of it all. And his thing is that he fights. And he fights with these guys fair and moves past them. And he calls out the the son of the old man who's about to go and uh, toss the fight anyway, throw the fight anyway. And he starts shouting at him, and then they end up really fighting. So what? What? It, so it is the kind of. So he actually never does the competition, but he we, does. <laughs> as well, because then this is him being of like Mamet being a fucking awesome filmmaker. He gives us the competition and the honor because he can yeah. write it that way. So now we get the the fight, the real grudge match between these two guys in front of the old man the cameras come around everyone in the room is watching it we see ricky jay's face fall like oh no one's betting on this fight i'm not making like they're yeah. all like all the the people who are like every every all the right things win and the right things are losing even just because the fight is happening the way it is it's so fucking good the feeling of that yeah and then yeah. there is this awesome fight and everyone's watching and then he does he know like the whole point from the very beginning there's always an out there's always an escape there's a and he does this great stunt and then takes the guy down and then this movie just goes into this other sort of kind of quasi religious space that is that again not realistic at all because the whole place goes silent yeah and he just like all of a sudden america has become like the this dome has become a dojo and everyone in it is a completely aligned with the honor of the ceremony of what is about to occur and uh, I'll let you let you finish it here, but I, I needed to like give it the full fucking setup that it deserves. <laughs> well, that well the 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 guy, the younger guy, the son, I guess, of the professor, gives him sort of the belt that is the the competition belt. I'm guessing, like hands oh, him yeah. the you won, like the like it's like it looks kind of a beige brown sort of thing, like gold. And or, so he so yeah. he gives him that, and he's like, okay, and then but then. The prof- the 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 professor comes down. His teacher. We don't see it though, he, right? You don't. You, you you. But you know. Yes. Because he hands him the red belt. <laughs> he earns the high. Which we didn't say, but explain it again in the movie. The red belt is like the highest, most special. Like there's like only the, one. The, like there's only one, and he is given that because his his teacher witnessed him practice the utmost honor and i'm sure realize like that this was a phony baloney thing that this guy is defending and defending their art the art that they he passed on to him like that he entrusted you know training him with and that he is like proven to be an honorable man and so he gets he earns not just the winning belt of the competition but the red belt which is sort of like means that you are that everything that he stood for that ruined his life and other people's lives was actually worth it <laughs> because it, because it is, it is just the most, it, he is the honor. He is the most honorable man in the room. And it's a power. It's a very powerful ending. And there's like, cause you don't get the moment of him no. exposing the fraud. You don't get, which I'm sure happens right after this. Cause he asked for the mic to come down and the mic comes down, but then he pauses cause he sees the it, red belt being passed him. It, and so he, we, and then the movie ends, so you don't get the big, like, exposed thing. Yeah, and the it's, music uh, <laughs> with the taiko drums that yeah. at the beginning, at the end, like, when this movie begins and when it ends, you know it. And this, <laughs> yeah, I mean, if Mamet doesn't know that this is his last movie, it sure seems like he does. <laughs> Yeah, because that end like, OK, we have the fight sequence, 
But then that the last two, three minutes of this movie feel like, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a totally legit payoff of what has happened. And it's also sort of surreal and like such a statement and so subtle, but also totally in keeping with the mammothness of it. And then that just that last thing, he calls for the mic. He looks up surprised he's handed the red belt and then they hug the hugs there's this great hug with the master and that's the end and the idea of being of i think the thing i think the things that the points the film is trying to make and the questions it asks of the those points are both so they have kept they keep this film in your mind like you're inspired mm-hmm. by the idea of keeping the honor, but this mm-hmm. film really interrogates that idea. Like, is it worth, I don't know. Is it worth trying to be the nice guy? <laughs> if being the nice guy is always going to set you up even to hurt the people, you know, and is it worth being virtuous? If that virtue means Ruins that, your marriage, yeah, and... that everything's going <laughs> like to suffer. Everything. Is there something selfish and about that? And at the same time, I think the, I, you know, I feel like the idea of on, of that kind of honor is to always be interrogating your own honor. Like if you sort of stay in a place, and I think that's kind of why this character works, because it's not like he's walking around saying, "I'm the honorable one." He's <laughs> constantly questioning, not his code, but how he can mitigate the damage of what he's doing. And it, I think it's also interesting that it's the final word from a filmmaker where this is his final film, more or less, and like as theatrical goes. And it's about sort of being the only honorable man in Hollywood and dealing with the entertainment industry, be it professional yeah. sports or the movie industry <laughs> and how they're all out to get you and they're all a bunch of fucks and but you <laughs> but able to get through this maze <laughs> if you can just not like like stick with like you can he falls into the trap twice for with both groups but he's able to kind of navigate out of it and be and still be and still be the honorable man and so i wonder if that i mean that must be some sort of a statement uh definitely i, I feel from david mamet just about working in hollywood and being a director maybe um <laughs> Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, this is what I was saying. Not that he thinks he's an honorable man. I don't know. But I think that there's something very, like, there's a great layer to that of this being his last theatrical movie and it being about a person who has gone through the hell of Hollywood, which we already know David Mamet doesn't think great of. Like, State in Maine is all about how they're a bunch of idiots that'll backstab you and <laughs> like, tell you, ruin you. So he doesn't like Hollywood, I feel. Like... <laughs> Yeah, well, I think he, like you said, conspiracies and toxic masculinity and uh, and just and capitalism and the 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 money drive, just like the the insane money drive. These are all themes for for Mamet. So Hollywood is you know is going to be a villain. Yeah, an intoxicating <laughs> gumbo of all of so many of his favorite targets. Um, <laughs> but I'll tell you, this is this is what I'm saying. This is what spoke to me so much about the film as like as the creator of this randomizing game to make this other industry that I have found that I find, uh, you know, I have the same misgivings about that Mike Terry has about the prize fighting world. And one of the fears and I've encountered it. I've had people try and steal that idea and had to go to, I literally, I had a situation where there was this band called Jim's big ego out of Boston that I was collaborating with on this project. And they wanted to do a thing where they used my format and me as the host and their music. And it was called the ego and the Oracle. And we did the show in Boston for three nights, big, you know, got all these rave reviews, then did it in Seattle for three nights, went back to Boston to do it for three more nights. And on one of those nights, I got, you know, there was like a, I got an argument with their manager, kind of like, kind of like the, the, like asking about the watch. And they, and then they were like, 
they decided we're going to do the show, like we're going to do the show, but we're not going to have you. We're not going to create like they put a thank you to Radio 8 Ball at the bottom of their website. And I was like, I actually went and protested their show outside. <laughs> like I like Mike Terry, like being like a madman. You did know, you throw, beat up 20 people? I did not. <laughs> no, but I every time they tried to do the show, I would send out the press releases to the to the Boston press and being like, hey, these guys stole this idea. And I mean, I didn't mean, I, actually, I didn't even think about that story when I was watching it just because it's a, that's an unpleasant story, <laughs> but that I think maybe that's, per, I don't know how much, how much of a universal experience that is. It definitely spoke to me personally on this archetypal level, archetypal level of, sort of having of having to fight for some sort of integrity in something that there you know where the integrity is essential to it and like anything that's randomized like when you promise to do something randomized and you cheat it's like <laughs> such a betrayal of I know, yeah uh like like i think it's a betrayal and like like of course it's a big betrayal but for some people who take randomness seriously, you know, it's like it's like cheating in sports. You should be kicked out of the sport for do, for doing that. And that's that feeling that Mike Terry has when he when he uh, takes on and gets to have the catharsis that in real life we rarely get to have. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes, red belt, bravo. <laughs> I'm very happy to have finally talked about it. It's and I haven't watched it since the theater. It has been a spell. But I, it's funny cuz when you see a movie 5 times, something kind of gets ingrained in your memory. <laughs> so watching it again, it was like an old friend coming to hang out. I was like, "Oh, I remember just being obsessed over the, every word in this movie and just and just really studying it and really watching it." Um so yeah, I and uh, you can find it on Tubi. That's how I watched it. Oh, our friends at Tubi. Our friends at Tubi. They keep, they they might not know the uh, info of Up Against Amanda correctly. But I hope they fix that. They right now. are our friends of, they show all the movies we want to see. And granted, there's commercials, which totally sucks. But the fact that for free, you can watch Red Belt unedited. Like they keep it all, all the profanity in. Uh, so... Just yeah, like with this it's... podcast, we're leaving all the fucking profanity in. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know what. I don't know what's going on. I, my, my feet hurt, so it's making yeah, me more but profane I, yeah, than usual. I, I wonder if Mamet will ever come out of filmmaker retirement. I, I have a feeling he won't. He's old now, and it's probably just easier to write a play. And maybe the grind got to him. Maybe he just had this as his final fuck you to Hollywood. Hey, and you know, when you, maybe it's also just when you, when you know, when you've achieved the, the height, thing... <laughs> Yeah. Then you know you have achieved the thing, and you walk yeah. away. He you got know? handed the red belt, and he was done. Yeah, <laughs> handed himself the red belt, and he handed walked. himself the red belt, and walked away. Oh man! So let's just talk a little bit more of just about Mammoth. What are your? Okay, there, there's the Mammoth films that he's directed, and then yeah. the Mammoth films that he wrote. Yeah. We can talk about the plays, but this is a film podcast, so maybe we'll just focus yeah. on those. What are your favorites of each? Okay, so I think let's start with the ones that he just wrote but didn't direct. I would say, I, I mean, <clears throat> I really love Lake Boat. And like that, <laughs> that is such a good movie. And it really is a simple movie. And I love that play. And I read the play first. And it's just it it's a great it's a great movie for I think for if you want to learn and a great play if you want to learn how to be a writer and a really good writer because it is just a series of conversations there's no real plot it really is a guy gets a job on this boat and it's all the weirdos on the boat that work with him and they just have all these sort of it feels very Tarantino in a way of it's just like these all these kind of blue collar guys philosophizing on life and pop culture and it's just so good and it's so well written and Robert Forster is great in it. And like we said earlier, JJ Johnson is great in it, but I also really love the untouchables, which like maybe you, a lot of people don't know he wrote and it doesn't quite, it doesn't That's quite a great screenplay. 
it doesn't quite feel like David Mamet, you know, because it's it was made for a big studio, so it doesn't have like the crazy repetition. But it's just a solid, like at this point, I feel we can say that is a classic Hollywood film. Like it's been over thirty years. That movie's perfect. I think it's one of the best De Palma movies. Uh, the performances from everybody's great. Sean Connery won the Oscar for it, and that is a solid screenplay <laughs> and another one and i'll stop for this one so you can have something to say i really love his version of the postman always rings twice the jack nicholson one uh directed by bob raffleson with jessica lang because it gets really weird because it goes beyond where the original went and it's gonna more i'm guessing like the book where it just goes into this weird stuff where he's in the at the circus and it's just like the plot goes into very strange things beyond just the noir plot and that's the first script that mammon ever wrote um for a movie so those are my ones he didn't direct as a director i would say my favorite is probably the spanish prisoner that that isn't like red belt's my favorite but i think the spanish prisoner is just so interesting and solid and Steve Martin's great and Campbell Scott. And that was the, actually that was my first mammoth. That was the first thing I ever saw that he, he ever did was the Spanish prison. I saw it at the Capitol theater when it came out in uh, 97 and I just loved it. And I was just so into the twists and turns and that are great. Rebecca Pigeon's great in it. And <clears throat> that is a solid movie. If no one has seen the Spanish prisoner, it's like his kind of version of like, a Hitchcock thing. It almost feels like a North by Northwest or something. It's very much a MacGuffin sort of plot, but it doesn't matter. And you're really into it. Uh, so those are kind of my, I think those are my tops. Yeah. How about yeah. you? Um, well, definitely the untouchables. Yeah. I think that's one of those sort of perfect, like it's everything, a perfect movie. everything came together perfectly for that. Like there it's, Everyone just pulls back enough of who they are and then gives enough of the rest of it so that it is a great mammoth thing without it being a mammoth thing. And it's a great De Palma thing without it really being a De Palma thing. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like maybe I'm just not a De Palma fan, but I love when he does like Mission Impossible 2. Is, is not Mission Impossible 2, but Mission Impossible is another one where it feels like it's not really De Palma, but goddamn, it might be my favorite De Palma because he's just like, <laughs> he's just craftsmaning out over this thing that someone else created. And it's the same thing with The Untouchables. It's like, it's not yeah. his thing. It's It's a chance to do... It, you know, they're all just doing their thing. So I love that. But uh, the verdict is oh, yeah. I think the one oh, that we, so we got to mention as yeah. so good. Probably the thing that really put Mammoth on the map cinematically. Yeah. Uh, uh, Sidney Lumet, Paul Newman. That, that is a great movie. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in my mind, it always gets mixed up with Absence of Malice. Which is another <laughs> Paul Newman. Yeah, I can see that. Sort of grizzled thriller, old, like trying yeah. to fight the, you know, fight the good fight. But uh, when you put the two together, it really, you see where the verdict is just on a whole other level of yeah. cinema. Uh, and then I'm with you <laughs> on Lake Boat. As a as a film that we could probably cover, I really we're going to do an episode about Spartan because yeah. that's that might be the one I go back to the most, which is weird. Uh, uh, but that movie's great. I feel that movie. If you like Red Belt and you haven't seen Spartan, I feel they really work together so well. It's another like lean mean action movie but done in a very smart way in a very mammoth way great val uh, it's kilmer. an awesome great val kilmer it is an awesome movie uh and you know we didn't talk about uh, the edge is another one that he wrote <laughs> that i feel <laughs> that like movie's, that movie's so good that that that's the so that's the alec baldwin anthony hopkins mountain men movie where they're just like survival they go into well, it's the just like these two guys and... <laughs> trying to out macho each other like they're like it is a mammoth play like of two guys like out but, macho each other but, but then bears with this yeah with all the cinematic scope of yeah. uh 
a bear Whack the dog movie. is really good too. That's the one I was that's what I was gonna say. I feel like I don't like to go back to that film because it hurts so much because it's so true. It's true. <laughs> yeah. And yet also when you're watching it, it goes down so easy because the writing and the performances are so uh, I, funny and yeah. biting. Like the satire is more a satire of manners and of uh, like inside Hollywood <laughs> like all of Dustin Hoffman's Robert Evansing oh, so through the whole good. That's thing. one of the best Dustin Hoffman roles. I feel he's so. This is funny. the second time this, you've been saying you've. You, that there are a lot of best Dustin Hoffman roles. He's, I think you know what he's pretty good. I he's think he's going good. places. I think he will be known as. A, and I feel like I always kind of when I think of Wag the Dog, I think of Bob Roberts, and when I think of Bob Roberts, I think of Wag the Dog. I think those are the two of the best kind of political satires of the 90s and like both of them kind of hurt to watch because of the intense truths that are in both of them yeah so, uh by the way bob roberts we did an episode on back in season one check it yeah. out uh yes. <laughs> i saw that in the theater uh man that song that willie nelson sings the old shoe old shoe the... <laughs> it's a good song it's a good song man old shoe it is a good song. <laughs> uh yeah Ma'am it. And it's just and it's what's sad is when you look at his filmography, there hasn't even been a movie based on a play of his since twenty fourteen. So we've been kind of living in a in terms of art, mammothless universe. And maybe I mean, I don't think he stopped writing plays. Like he's been like having things get made, I'm sure. But like no one has really been doing anything with it. Okay, uh, I just wanna filmically. I just wanna read his like the ones that he just wrote. There's a couple of the ones we've left out. So we did. We don't. Uh, so he, he wrote Hoffa, the oh, Jack Nicholson yeah. one. He Which is wrote, fine. Uh, Ronan. Oh, yeah. Credited like as that. Richard Weiss. So he didn't even took his name <laughs> off of it. But still. I like that movie, yeah. though. Then Lake um, Boat, uh, Hannibal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hannibal. And then uh, that's Edmund weird. from 2005. Edmund is weird. That's a good one. Because that's Stuart one Gordon. Of his, yeah, that movie, that is his darkest thing. Because that is one of his first plays, I think. That's a pretty early play for him. It's really racial. It's almost like it is the good morning Miss Wyckoff of his <laughs> filmography. It's very violent and racial and it's upsetting. It's not good morning. It's good luck, Miss Wyckoff. Or, or good it's luck. Good morning, Vietnam. <laughs> I mean, it's good luck, Miss Wyckoff. But it's like it's like Wyckoff where you're just like you're just horrified by it and you're just questioning the intentions of it and what the fuck is it? And it's just so, so fucking dark. And the fact that it's directed by Stuart Gordon makes it even darker. But it's great. It's really good. But it's definitely you have to be in the right place for it because it is a very it leaves you very upset in the whole movie you're just kind of horrified and upset by what's happening in it highly recommend it <laughs> if you want to be uncomfortable for 90 minutes but it's an interesting one for sure i don't yeah um and what are the best ones with rebecca pigeon i mean she i the first one is to me the best one still that i saw was that was in, in uh spanish prisoner and what's funny is that so many when I told people we were doing Red Belt, so many people were like, "Oh, Rebecca Pigeon is the worst. She's what? like the worst actress." Oh, and I'm like, "What you. are you I saying?" Wanna, dude, how dare and I think you. it's just you. like her delivery is so unique. I think some people read it as like monotone or bad acting. Uh, and I remember this. I remember hearing this when a Spanish Prisoner came out too, being like, "Man, why did he put his wife in there? She's awful." And then I'm like, no, no, she's great. There's just something about the way she's like, it's like she's perfect for delivering that mammoth dialogue. Yeah. And she has this gr just really, I don't know, to me, that comes off as this fantastic ambivalence, but not ambivalence to the work that their characters carry this ambivalence. Who's the actor who broke out of the Hal Hartley films? The main the actor, yeah. Who's that main actor? Oh, um, Martin Donovan, who came out of the, all those Hal Hartley films. Yes, like he yeah. has the same kind of like nobody says he's a bad actor, but he always seems like he has this slight distance that makes him so interesting. 
to watch. Yeah. And I feel like Rebecca yeah. Pigeon is like that, although just like, oh, yeah. so much more attractive. <laughs> I feel she <laughs> I feel she actually would have fit in really well in a Hal Hartley movie because everybody in his movies have that weird yeah. way of talking, which I know is really off putting to a lot of people and why they can't get into his movies sometimes. But like she I'm just like drawn into her, like in Spanish yeah. Prisoner. State and, in Maine. And State in Maine. Like I get why people are weirded out by how she talks, but it's to me it doesn't come off as bad acting. It's very deliberate and it's her own thing. Like it's just there's something really exciting and, and about don't you know people is. like that like i know people who <laughs> are who just it's part of what's interesting about being friends with them is that they have this odd gate to their speech that makes you listen to them in a, an interesting way uh i mean i wonder what those people like miranda july is another one who i think of yeah yeah as being like yeah. there's something odd about her but of course that she's a performer and there's that's what makes it so makes everything they do interesting and then you give that that person great dialogue yeah you don't need to do a lot like i'd be weird if rebecca pigeon was flouncing all over the place like <laughs> you know like someone on the cast of glee or something that's just not <laughs> It would like no one expects that of Catherine Keener. Have you ever seen her, like, do be totally normal, <laughs> like be goofy? Like, she, I guess well, there's something also, a little bit more down to earth. Like, I guess I yeah, whatever. I don't know. And I think maybe too, it's that like Rebecca Pigeon has mostly only done David Mamet movies, so like you're only seeing her say this very deliberately written dialogue, but nobody's shitting on like. Joe Mantegna or Ricky Jay for saying these weird because their lines do sound kind of weird. They don't sound natural. Yeah. When Ricky Jay says, I love a fighter, what the fuck? It like it doesn't, that's not <laughs> how anyone would ever actually say that. <laughs> or like the way everyone repeats it, but it's just like it's like it's a very mammoth way of talking. <laughs> just like other great like just like if someone were doing Shakespeare in real life, you'd be like, What's wrong with you? Why are you saying words this way? But in a play that is deliberately written, like people didn't actually talk like how they did in a Shakespeare play either. It's 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 stylish writing. Like it's it's very it's great writing. Like I love writing like this. It's very, you know, just it's its own thing. And then the actors are gonna be if they're good, they're going to make it work. And they always make it work in these movies. Um, I think so. I think to hell with those people. They're wrong about Rebecca Pigeon. She's great. Last scene in Bird Box from 2018. Oh, I never saw Bird Box. Norm. But there's no talking in that movie, right? Isn't that a, or no, that's the other one. Or they can't see it. See, I get that one mixed up with the quiet place. Bird Box is the one where... You have to be blindfolded because if you see the monsters, they'll eat you or something like that, right? It seems like they stole all of these ideas from Mike Perry. <laughs> I think that that's true. Uh, or maybe yeah. they stole them from me. Do you think maybe it's possible <laughs> that... I mean, this came out after Radio 8 Ball. Do you think it's possible that David Mamet stole Her. his idea for Red Belt from my Radio 8 Ball idea? Maybe. My friend Chris Roberts worked <laughs> for his theater company. Yeah. I could be know? in this I could be in a lawsuit and you know Chris <laughs> Roberts walks in like David Mamet. <laughs> hey, I'm your new partner. <laughs> <laughs> or you have the meeting with him and he goes, Let me take care of this and then he doesn't come back. <laughs> oh, have you ever um have you ever had to do or chosen to do Mamet in like any of your learnings in your young age of, of an actor or were you uh, into Mammoth then? Did you ever do sides or anything? I did. I learned the monologue uh, that Al Pacino does to yell, to take down Kevin Spacey in the movie. <laughs> like, you never interrupt a pitch. There are men working here. <laughs> Real men. <laughs> I can't do the whole thing, but yes, I, I, it, it feels, it feels great to say. <laughs> it's funny when I was in uh, Muskogee, I went to their Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. They have like a big museum there, full of you know like Merle Haggard stuff and uh, other people from Muskogee. And I, I don't even think he worked there. He was just there. Some guy was there, and he was like, because I was there for a film festival, and he was like, "You're yo, you're a filmmaker." He's like, "I'm an actor. I did American Buffalo." 
And he started walking around the museum just yelling, fucking Ruthie, fucking <laughs> Ruthie. And I knew what he was talking about, that the people I was with thought he was insane. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I was like laughing. I loved it. It was like, yep, he is not exaggerating. That's the beginning of the play. And he he did American Buffalo and he played that character. And he was just quoting all the lines from it. And it was great because he looked like someone that should definitely be an American Buffalo. He had that kind of Fron, Dennis Franz-esque sort of, uh, or just like, uh, you know, he just had that kind of pawn shop look. <laughs> yeah. The That's movie, a great movie the, too. Uh, see, it's, I didn't see that. Uh, it, if, if you've seen the plays, it really does. The two films that I had a hard time with, were Glengarry Glen Ross and American Buffalo, and particularly American Buffalo. Glengarry Glen Ross is just such a powerhouse of what it is, and there's new stuff added to it yeah. uh, that I it was easier to come around on, but I don't know. I had a hard time I think it just with it, the, the movies. La- I think both those movies lack cinematic qualities, which I think brings it down. You know what and they so needed? You are just... They needed someone what? to hypnotize a chicken. And <laughs> if <laughs> if Dennis France came out and hypnotized a chicken, would you be more into That's the... cinema. Now we're talking <laughs> okay. visual visual storytelling. Sorry, uh, but I think those... Check like, out I our think... Even Cowgirls Get the Blues episode <laughs> if you want to get that joke. Sorry. But I think they feel like filmed plays and that just kind of comes yeah. off as it doesn't work. And that's I think that's the the danger of whenever anyone adapts a play into a movie is that it doesn't quite capture the magic. You have to add you have to work hard. You can't just be confident that the play is good and the actors are good and film it. You have to actually make a movie. And like that's why I think that will kill so many movies based on plays is it kind of feels stale. You have to tweak it enough to make it a film. (laughs) And those two movies I don't think do. And I really like both those movies just because I've never seen those plays. This is the only way I've been able to see them. And all the actors are really good. Um, But it just just doesn't quite work as a movie. You didn't say it was one of... uh, You didn't say it was one of Dustin Hoffman's best roles. He's good in it. But it's, but you know, no, I, I agree with you. <laughs> but is he bad in anything? <laughs> you no, know, he's he not bad. In, some, but there's has some he phoned that... in anything? Uh, uh, but no, yeah, I think you you should watch Edmund. That's good because it's based on a play, but it does not feel like a play. Like because it's Stuart Gordon, so he can't help but like be intensely cinematic. Um, yeah, I think I'm gonna go watch some Hal Hartley films. I've only seen two of them. Really. Yeah, I've only seen uh, Trust and Amateur, and that's it. And I know that he just, I think he was one of those people that was so big in Olympia. Like, I dated a woman who was obsessed with him, and I always heard from people in college, like, I think it was at the right time, where it's like everyone talked. It was like why I've never read Bukowski. It's like I got so burnt out on the people around me that loved about him them so much that I was like, I don't need to, I need to find something different. But I feel like I need to go and actually, I think I would really like Hell Hartley's stuff. I think so too. It's, it's so its own thing. And especially now, maybe it's easier now because there's just a finite number of them. And... And so it's not like, oh, the, who is this guy? What I'm, what's the conversation I'm getting into? It's a nice, concise little filmography. I think it's around probably 10 films. And I really love, uh, what was the last, one of his last films that, uh, I mean, I love them all, but I'm trying to think of like what we would, if we were going to do a, film of his for this i might go to no such thing that's what it's called oh yeah the one that's like his beauty and the beast or whatever yeah i really really <laughs> enjoyed that film uh but i i love all of his films but it's it's mo- it's in some ways it's the least it's like the most hollywood hal hartley film hmm. uh, but yeah all of them henry fool well henry fool is so great maybe that would be the one that's the most Hal Hartley, Hal Hartley film, I think. Uh, and I but, think he, like Mamet, has been kind of forgotten about as a filmmaker. I feel like people studying film now aren't going to these people or going to the movies. I think they're kind of getting lost in the past, sadly. Yeah. Them and Tom DeCillo. 
<laughs> yeah. Oh, very much so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you thought you had the world on a string, Mr. DiCillo. <laughs> You know, not everyone can be a Tarantino or a Paul Thomas Anderson. Like, you know, like it's it's a hard, like as Red Belt proved, it's a lot of hard work to navigate through Hollywood and dealing with their schemes and lies and backstabs. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, you have to be really tough to make it through. And even Mike Terry couldn't do it. Oh. He seems like a tough guy. But speaking of which, <laughs> bringing it back to Chibatal Ejiofor. In preparation for this, I watched the first episode of The Man Who Fell to Earth, the new series oh, that he's in. Oh, yeah. And uh, I don't know if you're going to love the series. I haven't watched the whole series, but the first episode you are going to love because this alien does some food comedy that you are. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen the David Bowie Man Who Fell to Earth. I've never seen that even that version. So. Me neither. I'm tempted to I, I'm tempted just hold off and watch this and and then see that later after this has run its course. But uh, yeah, I, I, it was, it's really great to see the, uh, Chubotel Ejiofor get to play something like this. There's a lot of inherent, there's a lot of comedy. It's not a comedy, but there's a lot of comedy to his performance. It's a very different kind of thing. It's sort of like, uh, when Jeff Bridges showed up in Starman Nice. And someone who you always thought of be, thought of seriously is playing a serious role that allows him to get very much out of the physicality that you're used to seeing them in. And you yeah. just see, oh, my goodness, this is an actor of even great. Like, I always thought he was a really great actor. But now I'm seeing what the great acting is. Like, oh, this can, <laughs> this guy can really go to some place that I had never thought. And, uh, yeah. Awesome. Really, really fantastic. So Very cool. Uh, of course, by the time you are listening to this, uh, the series probably will have run its course. Maybe it'll be on its second season. <laughs> <So> <laughs> this is we're in the time when we're recording these uh, in the hiatus. So who knows what 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 world it will be released into? But it's been a it, it's been a pleasure talking with you about uh, yeah David Mamet, uh, yeah. Hal Hartley, Tom DeChillo. <laughs> The, yeah, the real real trinity of great New Yorkers. One of whom is from <laughs> Chicago, and uh, anyway, okay. Um... Radio Eight Ball. Andras here. When I'm not co-hosting the World Is Wrong podcast, I'm hosting and producing. The Radio 8 Ball podcast, where we answer questions by picking songs at random, like picking musical tarot cards. We've hosted musical divinations for people like John C. Riley, Patricia Arquette, Tig Notaro, and Fred Armisen, and hosted over 200 songwriters providing the randomly chosen answers from Inara George and Dan Byrne to Mose Allison and Alan Toussaint. That's Radio 8 Ball, all one word. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts and download our app from the iTunes App Store. Dear listener, if you are just discovering our podcast, you can find all of our episodes on our website at theworldiswrongpodcast.com. You can also write to us at contact at the world is wrong podcast.com or follow us on Instagram at the world is wrong podcast. And now back to the show. Brian. Yes. <laughs> have you ever been in a martial arts class? Uh, I have not. Uh, I thought about it once, like in my life, I think maybe after I was really into like the karate kid or something, I was like, that could be fun. But it's like exercise. And I don't like exercising. And the few times as a kid, when I like tried to do sort of extracurricular activities that had nothing to do with movies, I lost interest pretty quickly. Like, I would get good at it. Like I was really good at high diving at one point in my life. And I took rifle shooting at one point in my life. <laughs> I think it's marksmanship. Marksmanship, whatever you want to call it. But like, 
uh it never it never really yeah, sports none of that so like martial arts i think requires a lot of attention and a lot of work that i'm unwilling to do so have, have you, you? <laughs> I, I, well, I, well yeah well yeah when i was a kid i i tried i did a couple of karate classes actually i might i wanted to do karate classes but my mom sent me to a tai chi class at evergreen <laughs> And it just got really weird and psychedelic. Like I was breathing and I could, I felt like the whole world was turning sideways. Like literally like I'd, I could feel the pull of the earth. And it was, it sort of, it affected my brain for years after that. But I did not, I did, I, it didn't help me deal with the bullying situation I was dealing with in school. So, did you have uh, a martial arts trainer for your stuff you do in Nightmare 5? Oh, geez. Brian. Or Nightmare 4, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> did you have the martial arts right, next thing you're going to be calling me rodney eastman mr eastman did you have training <laughs> no, no. for <laughs> uh they did send me to training for it but then when i got on the set they uh they had me just do the sort of these big roundhouse movie punches <laughs> and by the way ding 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 you just asked the most asked question that i the, the question <laughs> i get more I than that. any I know. <laughs> in it's like oh boy wow it's a hanging curveball even... what's the least asked question what's one that no one's asked yet you're always wondering why has no one asked me this um <laughs> and would you like to be in our movie oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, boy um <laughs> that's the one i'm still did waiting you ever do uh, did you ever do any other stunt training for other movies I mean, I've done, I've done some, not really stunt training. I mean, they'll tell you on the set, like, fall on this mattress. Yeah. Or I'm trying to think if there's things, not really training. No, no, they just kind of threw things yeah. at you, put you in a car okay. and ran it off a bridge and <laughs> hope you'd be okay. <laughs> no, usually they have stunt people there to do stuff. Okay. Um, okay. I remember <laughs> in Nightmare 4, there's a part where I climb off the sea, off the roof yeah. and sort of hang yeah. down. And uh -huh. we did that multiple times. And then afterwards, my core was so sore. I was I remember being sore for days because I was just kept swinging down and hanging. It's like you're a kid and you just think, oh, I could just do this because I was like 19 years old. <laughs> and, you know, you do that five or six times, seven times. You know, no stretching. And then you're just like, wow, why does my core hurt? <laughs> anyway, uh, so you haven't done you haven't done martial arts. You don't no. like exercise. Not really. Have you ever done any like even like sort of meditation or anything that's like requires breathing and focus? Oh, yeah, I've done I've done that. And I do that. Like I've done lots of meditation and mindfulness and breathing. And like I do that all the time. Yeah. Like definitely, so I got that part down. It's just the uh, the punching part and the kicking, not so much. Have you ever been in a situation where someone was strangling you from behind, but you knew that through your breathing and your meditation, you could escape <laughs> their hold? No, I've, every time I've been attacked has been swift and quick and caught me off guard. So they never held me long enough. It was always like a side swipe, dirty fight. I've only been in dirty fights. Really. Yeah. <laughs> I know the audience is interested. Could you tell us about one of your dirty fights, Brian? Uh, I had uh, in grade school, this kid punched me in the nose out of nowhere. And he swore he didn't mean it. And he was really shocked and sad that I was upset by it. But it like busted my nose open, bleeding everywhere. Cried to the principal's office, made my, our parents come in. I think he was expelled from school for a few days. And I didn't, I never understood it because he was a nice guy. He was my friend. But like, for whatever reason at recess, I, he just whacked me in the face. I don't even understand what happened. And I was just like, that's a pain. Have you ever had your nose punched? It hurts. Yeah. Uh, it hurts bad. <laughs> so Did that, you see stars? Uh, I don't remember. I remember it just was like the taste of that, that kind of copper blood kind of, and then just like the pain that kind of shoots through your face. And it was just sort of like a, whoa, baby feeling. Well, I don't know. Maybe you should have taken some martial arts classes. Just or saying. maybe I was asking for it. I don't remember what I was saying right yeah. before that. Were you saying, so. Yeah. <laughs> I could have been a real jerk. Uh, I don't know. Were you, uh, saying, were you saying something mean about uh, 
I'm trying to think of like who would you be <laughs> who would you've been being a jerk about like in like 1989 yeah you're like <laughs> i don't i don't know <laughs> oliver stone is overrated <laughs> I think he took yeah. too many liberties with GF, JFK. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Would that have been it? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Would have been about MacGyver or something <laughs> like that, probably, in 1989. Oh, um, geez. Okay, well, <laughs> it couldn't have been about next week's film because it no. wasn't out by 1989. Next week, we're doing Spartan, another misunderstood David Mamet uh, action film, action not a well, I guess kind of an action suspense yeah, thriller thriller yeah. uh, that is so good stars Mr Val Kilmer and yeah. Uh, yeah well just go go find it watch it you're in the Mamet <laughs> mode right now you've you've, <laughs> you've watched Red Belt you've explored it with us and now just keep going. Spartan, yeah, yeah, you know, and then work your way back. Uh, check out Lake Boat. Woo, that's a good one. But <laughs> yeah. that's for another time. Yes, we're going to be so next week. We're doing not next week. Sorry, I'm just so used. You're to still learning. It. Yes, two weeks from now, when we return, we will be talking about Spartan. And if you love us, if you can't get enough of us, we each also have another podcast that's been going on for years. Andras has the Radio 8 Ball Show, which is how long have you been doing that for? A very long time, right? Started on KAOS, Olympia Public Radio, in 1998. There are literally hundreds of them to listen to. I think you stopped uh, so far, took a break at 666. Is, is that right? We got a little bit past that. But yeah, we were right, right. around 666 when we, <laughs> when we realized we need to take a break. And just focus on movies. But yeah, it's out there. Lots of musical guests, lots of celebrities. We reference it a lot on the shows. Check it out. Radio8ball.com. Uh, it's Radio8ball, all one word with the number eight in the middle. And you <laughs> also have another yeah. podcast. Which I do. I, I might be of more interest to our listeners because it's a film-based <laughs> podcast. Yeah, I do. A show called The Director's Wall with the great AJ Gonzalez, who's been a guest on our show he many, is great. many times. He is great. And uh, we are going through every uh, film by a director. Uh, we did M. Night Shyamalan. We're kind of at the tail end of Coppola now. We're finishing up Coppola. We're in the last few movies of his. So check it out. We recently had Andres on to do... The Rainmaker, which is one that you wanted to do for this show, but I said, no, no, we had to do it on the other show because it's a couple of things. So, but it's definitely very much in the world is wrong sort of territory because that oh, is a movie man. that nobody likes and nobody talks about. So, I've been we wanting got to, do to that. talk about the Burt Lancaster classic, The Rainmaker, co starring Catherine Hepburn forever. <laughs> It's. I was so glad to talk. <laughs> Wait, with that's the wrong movie. 1956, Depression no, era. Rainmaker, 1997. You're th you're confusing Burt Lancaster with Danny DeVito. Oh, okay. Well, is it the Danny DeVito, <laughs> Matt Damon? <laughs> I know, and I was there. I was the there. Rainmaker. I was there to yeah. talk about it. But yes, uh, people might when they hear the Rainmaker. I think. That at least the older folks in our audience are all like, wait a second. Or they're thinking of the William Cat 1982 television motion picture. So it just depends on which ra the Rainmaker you're excited about. Wait, you know, did they make was all. was the William Cat <laughs> a, a, a remake of the Burt Lancaster? Uh, yeah, it was based on the same play. It wasn't yeah. based upon the Too yet early. to be written John <laughs> Grisham novel. No. No, but hey, check out William Cat, Tommy Lee Jones. I'm sure it's very good. Directed by our friend John Frankenheimer. Oh, so, damn. They... <laughs> <laughs> he, he's on the set of, of the island of Dr. Moreau just being like, "Couldn't? why can't we get Tom, can we get Tommy Lee Jones to come and play a role in this? He was so easy. He does not give a shit. <laughs> and I bet Tommy Lee Jones is like, I'm not going to some island. <laughs> Yeah, that's my best Tommy Lee Jones impersonation. Uh, but yeah, I don't care! <laughs> You've been offered the island of Dr. Moreau. I don't care! <laughs> that's probably what happened. 
But yeah, it was a blast. Uh, thanks for having me on your show. Of course. And uh, yeah. So if you have thoughts about this week's episode or about next week's episode or about any week's episode or about just not even about an episode at all, but just, you know, just you want to write to us. Uh, yeah, you what can have for lunch, whatever you want to know. Tell us something that let us know you're out there. Uh, it, all of a sudden we're, we're deluged with lunch orders. <laughs> No, no. <laughs> I didn't say I was going to buy them lunch no. if they want to know what I had for lunch. Yes, okay. you know, I'll share that. Uh, yeah. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. <laughs> I don't think I want to know. Maybe I want to know. I guess I kind of want to know. Anyway, uh, if you want to know, <laughs> write to us at contact at the world is wrong podcast dot com. That's our website, www dot the world is wrong podcast dot com. And there's a page there for every one of these episodes. Uh, not the bonus ones, but all of the episodes. And usually the bonus ones find a place to sit on one of the other pages. Anyway, this is yeah. too much inside baseball. Point is, <laughs> there is a fantastic resource there. If you like this uh, the show, check it out there. You can also find our episodes, most of our episodes, on YouTube. And I know a lot of people watch them there. Uh, we, don't get, we don't count those in our numbers as far as the... The podcast is concerned, but they're still real views. And uh, if you'd like to find us on social media, you can find, uh, well, find us both. But really, Brian runs the Instagram at the world is wrong podcast, because that's where all the fun pictures and, <laughs> and movies and just nice, nice interactions and images are. And I work the sleazy side of the street at <laughs> world is wrong pod on Twitter, where you can find me constantly, constantly, constantly liking all Woody Allen related content. <laughs> and, uh, Sometimes sharing things. <laughs> anyway, just check it out. But not you, Brian. Don't look. It'll, it'll terrify you. <laughs> but it's all good. It's all. It's all. You know, it's the way Twitter works. You know, you, these are mean. These are mean streets, and you gotta. You gotta. <laughs> you gotta walk them with some swagger. Anyway, I <laughs> uh, hope you enjoyed the show. I hope you are ready for Spartan next week. Uh, two weeks from now, sorry. I hope you're ready for Spartan in our next episode. And you ready for me to send these people off to their yeah. to their next uh, dojo? Yeah. Okay, well. The world is wrong. And it's probably wrong about you. I tried to say it like I was a mammoth character. I still I don't think that was right. <laughs> None of the fighters know the fighter's gift. You weren't supposed to know. You weren't supposed to know. I don't get it. We pick who gets the white marble. Here's what you're missing. Here's what you invented. The thing, it's not a way to ensure the fight is fair. Any two guys fighting for money, no way the fight is fair. What you did is a way to fix the fight without the fighter's knowledge. You stole my idea. How about that? So look, what? Who gets the pass tonight? You. Every fight tonight, the other guy gets the handicap. You win, you go home with 50 grand, you settle your various debts. How about that? Make a name for yourself. I love a fighter. What the fuck? Hi, I'm Brian. And I'm AJ. And we have a podcast called The Director's Wall. Examining a filmmaker's career, film by film. First up was M. Night Shyamalan, then Francis Ford Coppola. Who's next? Is there anything to this whole auteur theory? Find out on The Director's Wall. Subscribe via Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or your preferred listening platform.